So um, many years ago, Richard Neuhauser and I had lunch together at a meeting of medievalists at Leeds. He and a colleague, John Jeffries Martin, had recently launched a series on the virtues and vices with Yale University Press. Was I interested? Yeah, I was. And this is the result. I chose the topic of anger because it is a vice, but also a virtue, because I had already edited a book on the topic, Anger's Past, as Lisa mentioned, because it was constantly in the news, and even more so today, because it needed historical treatment, despite the fact that I had edited a book that was only on the Middle Ages. There's a lot more to history. And last but not least, because it played a pivotal role in my own life. And that's where I began my book with a rubber doll that when I was perhaps three years old, I loved fiercely and hit equally fiercely. I stopped when I overheard my mother saying disapprovingly to a friend, that girl has a lot of anger in her. What was this anger? My book aims to find out. It's not a history that unfolds chronologically. Rather, it's an inquiry into conflicting approaches to anger. As you may see from the table of contents, it's divided into three parts. Part one uh, speaks of the traditions that reject and censor anger. In part two, I turn to ambivalent attitudes toward anger as a vice, but also as a virtue. In part three, I take up the idea that anger is natural, whether biologically or socially constructed, or both. Today, I want to talk briefly about two related developments in this long and complex history, the emergence of anger as both vice and virtue and the ways in which these ideas have had impact on our notions of gender and race. Although the opposition of virtue and vice must be largely associated with Christianity, I shall stress that even the ancient world was ambivalent about anger. Aristotle held that in some instances, anger could be a virtue, but in most instances, it was a vice. He defined anger as a desire for a perceived revenge on account of a perceived slight on the part of people who are not fit to slight one or one's own. Note the emphasis here on perception. Anger is a judgment about the rightness or wrongness of someone else's actions. And when that judgment is correctly made, it is virtuous, but this rarely happens. Anger is the correct reaction, not only to the very limited scenario of someone slighting or insulting us who is not fit to do so. Mm, uh, it is, and that fitness has to do with status and Aristotle's extremely status sensitive society was in no way democratic. So in his world, a person of inferior position could not rightly get angry if someone above him reminded him of his inferiority by an insult or some sign of disrespect. For example, slaves could never get angry virtuously and neither could women, even if they were heiresses and very high status, because in Aristotle's view, women could not make a fully reasoned judgment. That is, could not make a correct perception. And the same was true of children. 
So for Aristotle, the trick, the path to virtuous anger was to feel it, quoting Aristotle, at the right time, on the right occasion, toward the right people, for the right purpose, and in the right manner. And that is the mark of virtue. Because Aristotle's virtuous anger had to be right for each particular occasion and had to be carefully calibrated so that retaliation would be carried out in the right manner, it was always a provisional virtue. A person might possibly make a mistake choose the wrong time or desire revenge in the wrong manner and so on. <clears throat> in which case, anger was a vice. Anger as a virtue was always the mean between extremes and it was best to err on the side of cautious restraint. And yet even this limited virtuous anger was drowned out by the Stoics, who thought even more than Aristotle about the emotions and their ethical roles. The Stoics soundly condemned every sort of anger along with most of the other emotions. Indeed, the Roman Stoic Seneca, who wrote an entire book on anger in the first century CE, thought nothing what ever virtuous about anger in any form. He agreed with Aristotle that anger was a judgment, but he considered it always to be a bad judgment. Like many modern cognitive psychologists, Seneca outlined three stages in every anger sequence. First, shock, the bodily signal that an episode of anger is about to happen. Second, thought, your judgment. Third, the emotion of anger itself. Let me give you a concrete example that most of us know all too well. Say that you're driving along at a reasonable speed and someone behind you honks. First stage, you feel an initial shock. That's the intimation that you're about to get angry. In the second stage, you think you are the object of honking and you have been wronged. In the third, anger seizes you and you want to retaliate. For Seneca, there's no way to stop the initial shock here. Oh, sorry. And the uh, third stage, you certainly can't stop because you're completely out of control but you are in control of the second stage. And that's the ethical moment. Since anger is never reasonable, since it's always a vice, you have a choice. And the right choice is to think of the things that will calm your impending anger. You think, say, the honk was inadvertent or that the honker wasn't honking at you or that the honker is a woman and so doesn't know any better, which is a very typical view of women in the ancient world. So you don't get angry and you pass the ethical test, at least in that instance. Seneca thought that if a person passed that sort of test habitually, it would become almost second nature never to get angry. For Seneca then, anger, was always a vice. Where a cognitive psychologist today would fully disagree with this scheme is at stage three. They would agree that we have beliefs, but if our beliefs about the response that we should take include anger, then anger may indeed be reasonable, right, and proper. But today, psychologists are talking about appropriate responses to threats to our well being, and they no longer use the vocabulary of virtue or vice. Yet those ideas remain if unarticulated. 
Aristotle and even more so the Stoics had considerable influence on the Romans, though not at first, when during Rome's Republican period, its martial ideals and their association with masculinity, anger, and violence prevailed. But after the Romans conquered the Greeks in four, and sorry, in 146 BCE, that privileging of anger began to change. And that's why Seneca, who wrote in the first century CE, when Rome was no longer a republic, but rather an empire, that's why he could speak disparagingly of anger, because he knew all about Stoic thought. To sum up, it's fair to say that in the Roman Empire, before its fourth century conversion to Christianity, anger was considered in a variety of ways by different groups, as a virtue, as a vice, as a necessity, and often as hardly a moral issue at all. But then the empire became Christian. Christians generally stood Roman values on their head. The warriors of Christ were martyrs, not soldiers proudly conquering barbarians. Family, the body, wealth, all those good old Roman values were largely rejected. But anger, that was a big problem. The Old Testament featured an often angry God. The New Testament did not. True, Jesus drove out the buyers and sellers from the temple, but no gospel account says that he was angry when he did so. And getting back to the Old Testament, human anger there was mainly censured. And so, even while the idea of an angry God was accepted by Christians, human anger was not. Indeed, early on, it became a demon, a vice, and a sin. Many schemes of the vices were elaborated by Christian thinkers, but circa 600, Pope Gregory the Great came up with the most durable of all. He made pride the root of the tree of vices. Here you see the tree of vices on the left as represented in a 13th century German manuscript. And I've simplified the schema and put it in English on the right-hand side. The seven deadly sins branch out from pride. They start from, with the spiritual vices, vainglory on the right, and then across it, anger, then envy, sadness, and then the bodily vices, avarice, gluttony, and lust. The tree was more than just a schema or a theory. When people attended church or heard preachers on the street, they learned that anger was a sin. When, as they were required, were required to do once a year after 1215, they confessed their sins, they had to do penance for anger. Moreover, there was not just one form of anger, as you can see on this tree. I, I've drawn the fruits of anger here, which are actually right here too on the manuscript. The fruits, the bitter fruits of anger, blasphemy, impudence, grief, fury, clamor, brawling, and insult. All of these were sins. And some preachers added more sins of anger as for example, the 14th century Spanish cleric Guido of Montehochen, who named mental commotion, stubbornness, and indignation among anger's offshoots. In short, it would seem that there was nothing virtuous about anger. Well, of course, 
there can be nothing virtuous about any vice because a vice is turned away from God. And yet God himself gets angry. His anger doesn't work the way human anger does. It's perfectly rational and it is directed at sin. One of its salutary effects is to inspire people to get angry on God's behalf. This idea began in the patristic period, that is the second to the fourth centuries, and was later expressed succinctly by that same 14th century Guido of Monteroje. Anger is virtuous when the desire for vengeance is according to the due order of justice and with charity, as when one sees the correction of sins, seeks the correction of sin, and not one's own vindication or the harm of one's neighbor. Such anger is called zeal. Note how carefully this is formulated. God's righteous anger is directed against sin, not the sinner. Now, there had been nothing like this idea before. Yes, there had been Aristotle's idea of anger as a virtue, but that was limited, depended on circumstances, and could never be absolute. By the contrast, righteous anger had to be absolute. It could not be wrong because it channeled God's anger, and God is never wrong. Today, many theorists of anger postulate that it is constructed during everyday interactions, a useful tool for readjusting relationships. It's both constructed and in the best of cases, constructive. But righteous anger, as theorized by medieval churchmen, was not constructed because it was God-given. And it was constructive only in one way, to get sinners to repent and change their ways. In the Middle Ages, this idea was elaborated in all sorts of ways and contexts. Recall that one of the poisonous fruits of anger on the tree of vices was the clamor. Well, in the Middle Ages, monks used the clamor to call on God to revenge them against their enemies. They elaborated a collective ritual in church, humbling themselves and declaring that evil people were disturbing and disrupting the monastery and its property, that is, the holdings of God. Humbly, the monks prayed that all the maledictions of God before befall their enemies. May they be cursed in cities. May they be cursed in fields. These monks were not angry in the ordinary sense. They were following a written ritual and they were expressing anger on behalf of God, petitioning him to protect his own. Their words were meant to correct the faults of their enemies. It was righteous anger, even though it might look like, sound like, and take the forms of ordinary cursing. In short, unlike the Stoics who wanted to control their anger, unlike even Aristotle, who thought that in some cases anger might be the right reaction, Christianity knew one sort of anger that was always right, indeed always righteous. For a long time, only those who dedicated themselves to religion, monks, priests, bishops, pope, had the authority to express their anger, to excommunicate people from the church, for example, and thus condemn them to hell unless they repented. There was almost no room for women to be angry virtuously, though there were exceptions, as for example, the seventh century Saint Gertrude, 
who, according to her biographer, expressed righteous fury when her parents wanted her to get married. But gradually, the idea diffused more widely to kings who claimed to exercise just anger among knights who went on crusade and among townspeople who, by the time of this depiction in the 16th century, were sometimes richer and more powerful than the nobles. In the 14th and 15th centuries, the dislocations caused by the Hundred Years' War led to numerous popular protests in French towns and countryside. At Paris, the citizens stormed the royal palace and the provost of the merchants, normally allied with the royal family, joined the crowd. On his knees, he asked the future king to lift monetary imposts for, he said, they quote, weigh down the people in many intolerable ways. Hardly had he ended his speech when the protesters made a terrible clamor, that's in the source, vowing that they would no longer pay. They would, quote, rather die a thousand times than suffer such shame and injury. This was righteous anger, a struggle for divine justice. But now it was being expressed by ordinary people. In England, a popular revolt around the same time as the Paris uprising featured a rhyme effectively anticipating Jefferson's all men are created equal. When Adam delved and Eva spun, who then was the gentleman? The savage wars that ripped Europe apart in the 17th century made clear that a united Christendom was a long lost fantasy and that morality had to be put on a new footing, separate from the church. And in that context, Stoic ideas were revived in a movement that historians dub Neo-Stoicism. A Stoic like Johann Weyer condemned anger. Court physician to a German duke, he elaborated a regimen of anger therapy that consisted of nine lengthy exercises punctuating every day with its demands. For example, review all your actions morning and evening, asking yourself which bad deed did you correct? What vices did you resist? Did you restrain your anger? And then during the day, repeat the horrible effects of anger on body and soul, meditate on historical examples of restraint, ask a friend to monitor your behavior. Bayer was even more insistent than Seneca because Unlike the pre-Christian ancients, he believed in original sin. People were in control of their lives only insofar as God's grace allowed. But did I say people? Weyer was thinking only of men. In his treatise, he told wives to keep quiet while their husbands practiced anger therapy. And how did the wives feel about that? Did they get angry? Weyer didn't talk about female anger, but many did. Consider an English pamphlet published in 1589 by an anonymous author calling him or herself Jane Anger. It was a forceful defense of women's anger fie on the falsehood of men whose minds go off to madding, which means off and go on a rant. Was there ever any so abused, so slandered, so riled upon, or wickedly handled undeservedly are we women? Men mistake women's virtues for vices. 
when they accuse women of anger, they're really objecting to good counsel. When calling them wrathful, they mean that women will not bear with their knavish behaviors. Here, it seems to me, she was claiming righteous anger for women. I see her as a distant ancestor of the women today who feel compelled to speak up. But in her own day, Jane Anger was reacting to traditional medical statements like that of Helkia Crook, King James I's personal doctor who a half century later wrote that, the passion of anger we many of us know by woeful experience to be quicker and more vigorous in women than in men, for they are easily heated and upon very slight causes. My point is that already by the 17th century, a vigorous debate was on regarding the virtue or vice of women's anger. That cannot be said about the anger attributed to blacks, whether male or female. There was a long tradition of demeaning the anger of the lower classes in medieval Europe. Around the time that the Wat Tyler rebels of 1381 were chanting their call for equality, elites were likening the peasantry to wild animals. This was the rhetorical tradition that American founding, ben, founding father Benjamin Franklin drew upon in 1747 when he evoked the horrors of what he called licentious privateers. Who can conceive of the miseries they can cause when your persons, fortunes, wives and daughters shall be subject to the wanton and unbridled rage, rapine and lust of Negroes, mulattoes and others, the vilest and most abandoned of mankind. The image of the angry black man, twinned by the more recent angry black woman, was born of such tropes. Let me try to pull all of this together. Anger holds an unusual place in our moral universe. It was and is a vice, one of the seven deadly sins. Even today, calling someone angry is not generally a compliment. Yet anger also was and is a virtue. A great one indeed, when it channels the anger of God. In that righteous tradition, people called and call today for equality and the righting of injustices. In that righteous tradition, people rallied against Trump's tax program in 2017, holding up, I'm mad as hell signs. And in that righteous tradition, Rebecca Traister writes about being good and mad. The problem is that today, everyone has a right to claim righteous anger, even neo-fascists and the Ku Klux Klan. The social polarization that many of us see around us is partly due to the fact that righteous anger is claimed by every side. Unlike other angers though, it cannot budge or compromise. I thus worry about political and social arguments that hinge on the power of anger. I want to end with the question that a spokesperson for the Black Lives Matters movement, Alicia Garza, asked in an interview with Rebecca Traister, why anger? Why not just organizing or advocacy or activism? Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara.
Um, that was really interesting. Julie, um, I'll hand over to you. Um, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you so much for that really um, fascinating talk. And um, thank you very much for the invitation as well to, um, to speak today and for the opportunity to be able to engage with um, Professor Rosenwein in, um, in conversation about her new book. Um, it's a real honour. Um, um, I find the book to be a magisterial exploration um, of anger and its multiple and complex um, and teeming histories. Um, and what emerges, I think, from the book is is not a sense of anger as, um, as a universal emotion um, whose uses and effects can be witnessed and predicted across space and time, but rather um, a sense of angers um, in the plural um, and angers that must be understood within their um, highly specific historical, political and social contexts. Um, and this is really deeply valuable because it helps us to um, to push back against our tendency to, um, um, and I'm quoting from the book here, um, mash angers together in our minds and common parlance, um, labeling every part of the mixture as, as anger. Um, rather, um, as she writes, quote, divergent notions of anger and various feelings of rage, irritation, resentment, frustration, jostle together within us, um, within our families, our neighbourhoods and beyond, unquote. Um, so um, I come from um, a very different field um, of uh, feminist media and cultural studies. Um, and my uh, recent writing um, has focused on the politics of anger um, in the context of the um, of the Me Too movement. Um, so that is the, the movement against um, sexual harassment and abuse that was uh, founded by um, African-American activist Tarana Burke in 2006 but which came to much greater visibility in 2017 and 18 uh, when it was taken up by Hollywood celebrities um, and tweeted uh, via a hashtag. <clears throat> um, and in my work, I've, I've suggested um, along similar lines, I think, um, that we're now in a moment where women's rage has become uh, popularised. Um, and, and this is somewhat incredible, um, given the long histories in which I think women's anger has been construed as monstrous or deviant or otherwise um, otherwise taboo. Um, and and I've suggested that, that it seems that women's rage is, is now all the rage. Um, and but my my concern has been to explore the extent to which this is really the case, um, whether women's anger against um, patriarchy, misogyny, and gendered abuse really has been unleashed in the way that it's often suggested it has been, um, and indeed whether it is um, something which is celebrated. So I was most especially um, drawn to the discussion in chapter 12, um, Anger Celebrated, about um, which in part um, discusses the Me Too movement um, 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 and what Professor Rosenwein calls the, um, the quote, current groundswell of, of women's wrath, um, unquote, and which also discusses a, a Rebecca Traister, um, um, as has just been discussed. Um, and so in this chapter, um, she considers how contemporary discourse um, embraces um, and um, in some cases celebrates women's anger and she contrasts this with them with the suffragettes um, who she says um, embraced a discourse of rights um, rather than an impulse of anger um, in large part because the suffragettes um, recognized that that to act according to rageful impulses um, would be counterproductive, um, given that women who are publicly angry um, are most often dismissed as, as scolds. Um, and conversely, she sees in Me Too um, perhaps more of this impulse to embrace um, um, anger. Um, anger is a metaphor for power, um, which women um, are seeking to reclaim. And, um, and there's also this comparison with the, with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, um, which has suggested, the Black, it's suggested that the Black Lives Matter movement does include anger um, as one emotion that has, that has played a role in protests. Um, but she says that um, anger is, quote, not particularly celebrated um, by this group, unquote. Um, and uh, the book looks at the Black Lives Matter, references the Black Lives Matter movement's website, which talks rather about healing 
um, about a commitment to a quote culture where each person feels seen, heard and supported, um, unquote. So in a way, it, um, it seems to me um, that the book suggests that Black Lives Matter has perhaps successfully um, or more successfully avoided the, the, the kind of roiling resentments that, 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 may, um, that may end up undermining um, a quest for peace and justice. Um, and ultimately, um, it, it seemed to me in reading the book um, that uh, Professor Rosenwein see, uh, sees the, these contemporary expressions um, of rage, whether they're on the right or the left, as counterproductive um, because they are all born of an unshakable certainty of their own essential moral rightness. Um, or at least I, I, I would like to ask her if, if, this, uh, if, read, if this reading of um, her argument and the book um, is, is accurate. So as she says, um, quote, the key challenge for today's celebration of so many angers is to step back from the flashpoint of their combustible explosivity um, and begin to talk, unquote. So um, um, anger or being mad, <laughs> um, in Rebecca Traster's words, um, are not goods in and of themselves um, and that we need some kind of um, ethical uh, reflection on our feelings of rage, <clears throat> resentment, humiliation and so on. And um, so from a feminist perspective, um, I find myself um, ambivalently um, in agreement uh, but also in some disagreement um, with this. So on the one hand, um, a strong sense I developed while reading the book um, is how women and other oppressed groups um, have been denied the possibility of, of entering into broader discussions and ethical reflections um, about their own anger, as, as, as I think has been set out um, just now as well. Um, um, because women, um, as has been shown, um, have been seen to lack the rational capacities uh, for such moral considerations, um, unlike elite men whose anger has been deemed worthy of um, sort of endless theorization, reflection and critical consideration. Um, and so it seems that perhaps one of the deep gendered injustices around anger is that women have been effectively excluded from this possibility um, of that, I guess, that ethical moment in Seneca's um, terms. Um, and um, in the context of Me Too, um, I've often felt that uh, sometimes that that um, that we as feminist activists have lacked um, the some of the moral and political resources through which to understand our own anger um, and find ourselves oscillating between simplistic notions of anger as either good or bad, productive or counterproductive, uh, vice or virtue, um, something either to simply embrace or to simply disavow, um, with not much nuance potentially um, in between. So in, in this sense, it seems incredibly important that, that everybody should have access to understanding these histories um, of anger, because as the book argues, this can help us to make sense of our own feelings and make judgments about what's the right thing to do. Um, and certainly learning about the complex histories of anger in this book has been really deeply um, illuminating for me. Um, on the other hand, I wonder whether the suggestion that we all, that we all need to step back from this combustible um, explosive rage might, might somehow reproduce the idea that, that all forms of contemporary rage are equivalent or that they have the same source. Um, so as the book argues, in the contemporary age of anger in Pankaj Mishra's uh, terms, um, the book um, argues that, that the source of anger is, quote, the sense that our honour has been insulted and maligned and we need to assert it and demand that it be recognised, unquote. So I wonder if there, if there is a potential risk here of implying, for example, that, that feminist anger is born out of the same sort of sense of violated honour as, as white supremacist anger or right wing nationalist um, anger. Um, as the philosopher Amir Srivinasan um, argues, um, we can and should discriminate between anger that is apt, that is a, an appropriate response to justice, um, and anger um, that is not. So for her, part of the consideration has to be about, about whether, about the, I guess, the, the moral um, appropriateness of anger is whether 
is whether the, the injustice is real or whether it's whether it's not. Um, and I wonder then, could there also be a risk um, in suggesting um, that the contemporary Me Too movement might do better to follow the, the rights-based discourse and perhaps the sort of pragmatism of the suffragettes and to avoid impulses to anger? Um, because if if the primary if 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 a primary or significant reason to do so is to avoid being perceived as scolds and therefore to potentially undermine the movement, then could this be a tacit acceptance of another kind of injustice? Um, <clears throat> so to ask women to play by and, and other marginalized groups to sort of play by the communicative rules of the patriarchal game um, and be respectable or be civilized could this be seen as another kind of oppression or injustice um and another question is is whether it is possible to characterize the suffragettes and black lives matter as movements that um that did or do not did not or do not um, embrace anger so in the british context um i was thinking of um of the actions of Emily Wilding Davison, who threw herself under the King's horse at Epsom in 1913, um, as well as militant suffragettes who attacked property, chained themselves to the railings at Parliament, burnt down buildings, um, and so on. Um, all the Black Lives Matter protesters um, it, um, in the UK um, who pulled down the statue of the, of the slaver um, Edward Colston in Bristol this summer <clears throat> in 2020. Um, and indeed, I think many voices in Black Lives Matter do emphasise the value and political potential of anger. And I think, you know, even combustible, explosive anger um, and often in doing so, drawing on a black feminist theory to do so. And I'm thinking here, of course, of um, Audre Lorde, who's mentioned in the book, um, as well as uh, Brittany Cooper, Angela Davis um, and others. Um, and then finally, the other question that I would, wanted to ask um, Professor Rosenwein was, um, um, she began with the story of herself as, as a little girl bashing the, um, the dolly and, and being told that she was angry. And um, I've been wondering um, what you would say to, to, to yourself as a young girl um, in the light of everything you've learned about anger, um, the lessons from history, how those might help that young girl to make sense of the anger that, that she was feeling um, at that time. Um, but, um, but thank you very much again for inviting me and the opportunity to read and engage with this really fascinating book. And I thoroughly recommend it to everybody. It's incredibly illuminating and um, incredibly helpful and thought provoking. And thank you very much. <laughs> well, um, Julie, thank you. That was beautiful, really beautiful the summary of so many of the arguments in the book. And um, uh, I, I'm really humbled by your careful reading. Um, let me try to answer your question with a couple of fairly simple points. One is, um, I, uh, I suggest we, expand our vocabulary. Um, you remember that uh, uh, Guido of Mon uh said, uh, I call this righteous anger zeal. Um, Martha Nussbaum has a new book, fairly new, on anger. She want, she's a neo-Stoic, so she wants to get rid of it entirely. But um, she says, we can be outraged, just not angry. Okay. So outrage is good, angry is good, zealous is good, uh, indignant is good, frustrated is good. But if you do a, an engram, a Google engram of all of these words, which are vaguely synonymous, you will find out that anger is goes way up, while the others, which started out actually about equal to anger, sort of diminish in use. I don't think women need to, I don't think that Me Too movement needs to reject anger or getting angry. I just want a bigger vocabulary so that it's not saying, I'm angry just like Trump is angry. 
I'm not angry like Trump is angry. I'm angry in a different way. And find a vocabulary that will uh, express this. Um, I think that that would be very helpful. We really have lost nuance. That's what I worry about. The other point that I want to make is the um, connection between violence and anger. And that's something that um, I tried to deal with in the book. I think maybe not so successfully because um, what I'm trying to argue is when you see uh, people acting violently, um, you need not assume that anger is behind it. I, I, uh, and on the other hand, when people are acting per perfectly peacefully, we should not assume that anger isn't behind it. Um, so, uh, I, but I'm very, because I'm a historian and can't go out and ask my, my subjects, how did you feel when you were uh, chaining yourself to you know, a fence and so on? Um, I do depend a great deal on what people say about how they feel. And um, so when I was looking at the suffragette rhetoric, they didn't use the rhetoric of anger. And that's really all I, I, uh, I, I was saying about that. I don't know if they were angry, if they were sad, if they were outraged, if they were feeling zealous, but all of these are possibilities. And I'd like for us to keep them in mind because I think that with these kinds of distinctions, we might be able to pry loose some of the uh, what, what is now seems like the uh, hardening of two separate silos uh, in a polarized society, uh, patriarchy versus feminism, for example, Nazis and neo-Nazis versus um, freedom uh, fighters. I, I feel like the left, the right, these categories, um, they're fine, they're, they're okay. But in order to be able for us to actually have a discourse in which issues are solved, um, I think we need a better vocabulary. Thank, <clears throat> thanks, um, both of you, for a um, very engaging conversation. Julie, do you want to respond before we open it to the floor? Um, I suppose um, it's, it's just so incredibly fascinating to me, and I guess it, it, it makes me think about really about the link between anger and, and political populism. Um, and um, well, my, my question, I suppose, is about whether whether we as individuals have the capacity, you know, whether individual ethical reflection on anger is enough to kind of stop these forces, I, I'm, or whether there's something, you know, whether our reflection on anger can solve the problems, or whether our anger is a result of these kind of deep structural inequalities, and the problem, and that the, 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 um, the approach, therefore, should be to change the the inequalities and then and then our feelings will change <laughs> good point 